I'm going to run this as a workshop style. So there's going to be a lot of exercises you as participants will do. So I would call this workshop as successful if you can achieve these two things. These are the minimum expectations to make this workshop successful. And uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, so we are going to run through a set of slides and followed by a set of exercises. Okay. Uh, quick introduction. My name is Ratina. I am the Agile Transformation Leader for Intuit. I am responsible for helping the organization improving their Agile maturity across the enterprise. Um, that's why I call myself as an organizational Agilist. And I am passionate about helping the teams to get freedom and joy in their work. So that's a big topic, you would have heard a lot about joy. So let, let's move on. Here is the definition of agility. The ability to both create and respond to change in order to profit in a turbulent business environment, which is common and a lot of people use agility in this sense. Now, what is enterprise agility? Okay. So forget about this definition. When somebody says enterprise agility, what comes to your mind? Or what do you think enterprise agility is? Adaptability of what? Okay. Purpose of the role, okay. Support function and the leadership, okay. Nimble organizations, okay. Empower teams, okay. Okay, fast and flexible, okay. Okay, scaling from team level to, what do you want to scale from team level to organization level? So, 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 there are two sets of, uh, you know, uh, themes. One is, many of you have pointed out the characteristics of an enterprise, which is uh, uh, agility at organizational level. So that's why you said fast, uh, flexible, nimble, so on and so forth. The other aspect is people talk about scaling from the team level to the organizational level. So there is an underlying assumptions in this case where you say that teams are nimble, teams are agile, organization is not. Or we have to make the teams agile first and then expand or scale it to an organization level. That's an assumption with which we talk. But uh, is that the way things happen? That's a big question, right? So I, I will talk about what is enterprise agility from my perspective in my organization perspective. Have you ever wondered about these questions in your mind? Have you ever seen these questions being asked by anybody in your organization? You might even ask yourself. How many of you have uh, actually used an agile board or a Kanban board at an executive level? or I have seen executives using, okay? Does it look like the same way the teams are using? To some extent, okay? Anybody else has seen agile practices being used at a different organizational level, not at a team level? Can you give some example? Awesome. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. 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 So, so when you ask these questions, or when you are trying to find answers to these type of questions, you are talking about uh, agility at enterprise level, right? So, from uh, our organization, so I'm going to narrate a story of how my organization has gone into agile and where we stand today. Into it, uh, as as all of you know, it's a product company, and we have started uh, agile like any other company with Scrum adoption. We started uh, getting all the teams in my organizations to uh, get trained on Agile, uh, on Scrum, and then they started working on Scrum. But as we started getting into a Scrum adoption, more and more teams started uh, becoming Agile. We started realizing that only the teams at the engineering teams at the lower level were very Agile. The rest of the organization remained the same, right? And uh, we started looking at why we are not able to take the Agile beyond these teams. And when we looked at the, uh, the levels of Agility, I would call it as there are at least three levels of Agility. Uh, the same principles, same philosophy, same practices can be adopted to suit at different levels, right? So most of us are familiar uh, at the operational level of Agility where the team involved in the day-to-day -day work use Agile practices. And uh, the top one is a strategic agility. Looking at the organization strategy as an opportunity to do agile and, and respond with agility. So that's at a strategic level, uh, typically at the very high level of the organization, um, which is mostly deciding how the organization roadmap is into the future. At in between, there is also another layer of portfolio. Uh, how many of you have uh, large teams where you have more than 50 people working. Okay, so you might have seen challenges in getting agile into the such a large teams, right? So that's the level. So we looked at all these options and we asked the question, what is enterprise agile here? And uh, do we call ourselves an agile at enterprise level if we are agile at all three levels? Right? So here is the, uh, the answer from my perspective, from our organization perspective. We need to be agile wherever it makes sense. It could be at all three levels, or it could be at level one and two, right? It doesn't matter, you know, uh, that you need to be at all three levels. It depends on your organization. It depends on the requirements of your customer that helps you to decide whether you want to be agile at all three levels. But if you are agile at all the levels that you need to be, you are already moving towards enterprise agility. So even an organization which is operationally agile and they, do, and they think that we don't need to be agile at the next two levels or at this point of time, they are fine with that, right? But at some other point of time, as the market evolves, as the new things uh, come in, they may have to be agile at a different level. So that's the whole idea. Okay, so how many of you are here, having understood this idea, how many of you here deal with enterprise agility uh, situations in your work? Okay. Um, what are the, the typical challenge or the biggest challenge that you think that you face in enterprise agility? Change in the mindset, okay. 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 Um, so I'm going to, we are going to discuss all these questions, which is easier, top down or bottom up, or is there any other way to address the, uh, the enterprise agile and uh, so on. Um, but if you ask me, uh, think, think, uh, think a bit. How many of you have been in a situations where uh, the teams try to do agile, but manager stands in the middle, and there are implicit messages getting across to the teams that agile doesn't matter to me. So team understands agile is important, but the team also realizes agile doesn't matter to the manager. So they decide how they have to behave, right? So, so what is causing this trouble? Is it a top down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so okay, so the the word manager that I used uh, mostly from uh, uh, an organization where people work together as a team in agile mode, but they are responsible to deliver what they are delivering. But there are people who are at the higher level who are working on deciding the strategy, deciding the portfolios, and so on and so forth, right? So if those people are not agile, so he set an example, right? The uh, marketing people are not agile. They don't believe in agile. So what happens? Can we afford to leave a particular part of our organization non-agile? That's another question, right? I'll give you one example. In my organization, there is a procurement team. And for a long time, we never interacted with the team, whereas most of the organizations have already moved into agile. So one of the uh, procurement person came to me and said, hey, can I join the agile uh, training that is being organized? I said, why not? But uh, we'll speak a lot of engineering stuff, but uh, you may find something useful. And this guy attended the session and uh, he said he was able to understand some of it and he wants to apply a few of the things. Session we had about a year back. And then slowly this guy spoke to some of his colleagues and said, hey, we need to talk to uh, Ratina and figure out how we can bring in Agile. The concepts are great, but most of them are tuned towards engineering teams, not for us, but we, we can do something about it. Then we uh, got, got together and we picked up just three concepts. Work in progress remit, for example. Having a Kanban board, for example. It's applicable to the procurement as well. Why can't we do that? And they were not doing it, by the way, right? And we brought in those simple, simple things, and we never called them agile, by the way. And we, we never asked them to go through a formal uh, Scrum Master training or agile. And that team doesn't have a Scrum Master, by the way. At the end of the one year, they are they are in a much, much better place in terms of how they are agile and how they are responding to, your, to their own challenges, right? So that's a classical example. Let me give you two pictures. The question is, uh, in the, the world that we live, which picture represents the way your organization is dealing with your clients? The second one? The first one is uh, popularly called as uh, calm waters. You know, everything is still, you are sailing through, no problems, everything is fine. The second one is white, white water la rafting. It's more challenging. You don't know what will happen in the next minute. The course is changing, water, uh, the speed is changing, the skills are tested every second you are on the right, right? So when the organizations are actually uh, facing situations like or are going through situations like whitewater rafting, organization agility becomes very, very important. That is one of the reasons why I talk about organizational agility. Maybe a couple of decades before, this may not be a most important thing to do. But today it is the only thing that is, more, that is important for any organizations to survive. Um, here are the top three uh, messages that I want to uh, give at this point of time, uh, and then we can jump into the some of the exercises and some of the examples that, that we need to discuss. Um, achieving enterprise agility is a journey. That's the first concept that uh, we, we kind of realize. You know, it, it's not something that we plan it over a quarter and get it done in the next quarter. It doesn't happen that way. And uh, there are many milestones, there are many stops across as you go in the journey, and the journey never ends. Because as the market evolves, as your customers evolve, your enterprise journey looks different two years down the line. I look back three years into the organization. Um, Intuit is already agile. It was agile three years back. But are we agile today? Yes. But the uh, Intuit three years before Intuit today are the same organization or the Agile is the same? No, it has evolved a lot, right? Um, there was a time when we wanted Scrum Master in each and every team. But today, it is not mandatory that every team should have a Scrum Master. But how did this happen? 
because anyone anyone in the in the team can play the role of scrum master there is no one designated person maybe somebody can volunteer and say hey i will do the following things see at the end of the day who is a scrum master he or she is expected to do certain things that's it right if anybody can play the role of scrum master in the team the scrum master does not exist but the role is being played a lot of people have asked i think uh, three years back i was uh, speaking in another conference in chennai and uh, I remember the topic was uh, what happens to managers when your organization becomes agile. And that's a project management uh, conference, a lot of project managers, a lot of certified uh, uh, you know, program managers who are the participants. At one slide, just like what he said, I said managers doesn't exist in agile world. And you can, you can imagine what would have happened. Half the people were up in the arms and they were raising slogans and say, hey, come on, stop. Three years back, not very far. I, I just need to tell them that managers, as a person, will exist, right? They're not saying that they'll be thrown out, but they will not be doing what they're doing today. That's the bottom line. They may have to evolve themselves. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, different types of organizations today. You might heard the terms like liquid organization, teal organization. Have you heard about teal organization? liquid organization, right? So there is a, there are certain set of responsibilities some people play. You may not call them as managers, but they operate at the organizational boundaries, they operate at the uh, verticals and horizontals where the information flow happens because that is not defined in the agile world, right? So the roles exist, but it may not be called managers and they may not be doing the same things that they are doing today. That's, that's the perspective. And the second thing is the journey is all about uh, bringing in a desired culture and mindset in the organization. So that's the journey that we are talking about. And the journey is riddled with complexity. Why I call this as complexity? Why the journey is so complex? Any guesses? Okay. Okay, so <laughs> it's our own kind, right? If we don't understand our own kind, what else can become more complex? It's about change, okay. Okay, so we are now hitting the, the rock. This is the question that I'm trying to answer now. Why this enterprise agile journey is so difficult? People who raise the hands who said we are doing enterprise agile, how many years you have been working on that? How many of you have been working on more than two years on enterprise agile? Four, five people. How many of you are working on more than three, four years? We are at it for four years now from where we have started, right? And we still see there are a lot of things that we can improve, we can do, we want to do. So here is the question. I want uh, uh, to do a quick table exercise identify top three reasons that make this journey very, very difficult or complex. Just talk to your team members and then identify the top three reasons. Because understanding answers to this question is what makes the second part of our discussion interesting. Right? And a strategy is again a long term, at least a year long or even more. But how do I make it short? Okay? Long term. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. I don't have one silver bullet for the whole company. Okay, anything else? Okay. 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 So how do you slow down the growth of your company? Yeah. Yeah. The 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 current state. I would call it as a current state. You you call it as bureaucracy. You call it political scenarios in the organization, or uh, the current dynamics of the organization. So from here, how do we go to the future? That's uh, another key challenge. Okay. So let's say, I mean, these are all connected. Yeah. <laughs> Where does the team come in here? Where does the agile practices come in here? But they are not the blocker, right? They are not making it difficult. So what exactly makes it difficult? So I'm going to give you a couple of slides from my perspective. And that's going to take us to the second part of the workshop where we want we will do some hands-on exercises, use some techniques to answer some of these challenges. This is how we look at how the organizational cultural, we call that as organizational cultural rubber band. What is cultural rubber band? There are bunch of components that you see here which are tied together using a rubber band and that rubber band is nothing but organizational culture. What are the things that are tied together? There is leadership, strategy, structure, process, people, all of them and all of them are tied together using a rubber band called organizational culture. Now I am going to ask you a question. Let us say if I look at uh, some of the answers you have given, what is in it for me or where is the future state so on and so forth. Uh, Let us talk about the strategy. Let us say you want to change the strategy so that your organizations can become more agile. So you are going to expand the strategy portion. What happens to the rubber band? The rubber band is elastic, right? Just expand the strategy. It gets pushed on both sides, the rubber band expands. What happens to the rest of the components? Yeah, so once the rubber band expands, the other components actually will not stick together now. The other components should also react to that change. Take the example of uh, people. So you want to change the people's mindset. We talked about mindset, right, as a first challenge. So you want to change the mindset of the people. So you work on the mindset of the people and people mindset expands or changes the way we want. What happens to the rubber band? The rubber band expands. But what happens to the rest of the items? Exactly, they are not stable, that is it. The rubber band expands, one item makes the rubber band expand, the rest of the items become unstable. So that is the bottom line. If you change organization, if you if you change anything, people, process. See, most of the time we have addressed uh, enterprise agility as a process thing in many organizations. We have brought in new processes. We have brought in new way of looking at things. So we basically expanded the process component and the rubber band has expanded at that level. But what happens to the rest of the components? People, they are not expanding. Process has expanded. Strategy has not expanded. So the rubber band becomes not a component that glues all of them together. So a lot of things become not stable. 
So that is one of the challenges and that is one of the reasons why the organizational agility has become a big, big problem. Okay. Now I will give you one example of, I take people as an example. Uh, so typically when we look at organizational agility in our organization, one of the things that we always do first is describe, uh, describe the future state. That is the first point from this team, right? So how does the future look like? That is the first thing we will do whenever you want to do anything at organizational level. Okay, we want to improve, but after improvement, how does this look like? That has to be clear, right? We are going to do an exercise on this immediately after that. But how do we know after the change what is going to happen? It is not based on promise from the agile leader of the company. I go and tell uh, my VP and say that, hey, if we do these, these, these things, our organization will become agile and uh, we can respond to the change faster, productivity goes up, people are going to be uh, engaged, motivated, it's all fine, right? But how does the future look like and how long it's going to take to go there? That's a big question. So what it means is you need to know where you are today in the first time. That's the first question and you need to draw a picture of what the future look like. Once you have done that, that's your organizational agility shift. So now look at from the organization perspective. If the organization makes the shift, the rubber band is actually making the shift. Now I'm going to restrict my discussion only to the people aspects. Currently people are doing something in the organization, right? And what happens to them when the future state arrives? Will they do the same thing? Will they do the different thing or they do the same thing differently? Do they have the same skill sets or do, do they need to get new skill sets? Here is the challenge. What happens to the people? So people are in the current state. Organization is actually pushing its way to the future state. People are transitioning and then they are reaching the future state. Now here is the deal. This organizational aspect is one transition from current state to future state, whereas for the people involved, there are multiple transitions because every individual goes through the transition. And every individual's mindset is different. Every individual's buy-in towards the future state is different. So what happens? The organizational <coughs> movement from the current state to future state or the journey. Let us say the journey is from here I want to go to the next step, right? Say for example, simple, I will give you a simple example. Uh, organization decides to uh, become um, more agile by using continuous integration and continuous deployment, CI, CD. So the current state, no CI, CD in the organization. The future state that I visualize is every team is through CI, CD. Now the organization is pushing the CI, CD. Now what happens to the people who are working in the teams? None of them know anything about CI, CD or they haven't used it. But they have to buy in into the future state and they individually need to go into the future state. Then this becomes successful. And it's, it's another complexity, right? There are individual pieces in the organizations that needs to first move forward. So essentially this is possible when all these people reach the future state. And this is an example only for people aspect. So I go back to this slide. Now you look at this. We just discussed about people. Now organization defines a future state for their process. Today we follow the following processes. We are using these, these, these things. And future, I want to do the following things. Uh, there is a future description of the process. Now, is that the only process that is impacted? There may be many processes which are inter interacting or integrated, all of them need to go to the future state. The same treatment or the same description applies to each layer here. Now you know how, why this becomes so complex, why it becomes so difficult. Because you, you see there are multiple components and each component, inside each component, there are individuals, there are individual processes, there are loose ends at all levels. So that is that is the reason why we find it very, very difficult. Now I am moving on to the second part of the discussion where how do I get, so one answer to this whole question is if we can bring 
the agility into the DNA of your organization. We are done. Am I right? What is the DNA of an organization? Culture, okay. Can you go a little more granular? People, people is the DNA of organization, okay. Set of values, okay. So that's another level of granularity because people have certain values, yes. Ah, why the organization exists, there is a purpose which is set. That is an important part of the DNA. So the enterprise agility objective should fit into that definition first of all, right. This is how I define the DNA of the organization. This is a building block, right. Philosophy, which is exactly what you said. What is the purpose of the organization? Values, what values the organization stand for? And then the mindset. The mindset is, if I believe in certain values, my mindset becomes that, right? Actually, values are typically written down. But what is the value of having values if people do not follow it? So it is being demonstrated through the mindsets and habits. And then the principles. Every organization has some reason. Uh, uh, you, you are committed to deliver something and your team realizes that they are not going to make it. How are you going to handle the situation? Some people may actually do extended hours to complete that. Some people will just call up and say we are not going to make it. Right? So everything comes from here. Values, mindset, habits and so on and so forth. So in other words, my answer to the whole complex problem is if we can bring in uh, the exercise of envisioning the future for the organization, will people understand? Maybe or may not be because I do not know what is the language of the organization. Every organization has a way in which the communication flows and there is a language that we do. So what, how, how do we do this uh, blueprint for the future? So this is what we are going to do. Uh, So this conversation, the future print conversation should happen um, at a level where, uh, so I will come back to answer this question because the exercise will give you the insights, okay. Um, okay, so this is what we want to do. Um, think about what is the current scenario in your organization where the organization is not agile or what is the future scenario. So basically define what is the current scenario, what is the future scenario and then write a one liner that defines or that explains this shift from current to future. So I will give you an example. Uh, the current scenario, I am just giving a real life example, the current scenario when an engineer moves from uh, a team in Bangalore to another team in San Francisco, that person is in for a big surprise or a shock. That is the current scenario because people use different way of doing agile. So for example, here in Bangalore, people uh, are exposed to, uh, let us say they do daily stand up and all those things, but they, when they actually go to San Francisco their team actually more into peer programming which is not very popular in Bangalore. So how, what, what happens to this individual? Is that a scenario where the organizational agility can improve? So the one liner that I will write, so I am defining the future state. So this exercise is little bit uh, difficult because we are thinking before something that we have seen. Right? So here is a one liner. If I uh, ask one of the engineer to move to another team in a different location in some other part of the world in the company, there is no shocks or surprises in the way the products are built in that team as well. 
So what are we talking about here? Consistency of building a product across the organization. Is that a worthy goal? Is that a, this is not the complete future state that we have defined, but we have defined a one piece, piece of the future state where the consistency is taken care of. Right? So here, this is what we want to do. Actually, there are two parts to the exercise. The first part is very easy. You identify current state and uh, imagine the future state and come up with one liner that depicts the future state. Right? That's the easy. The second part is is what you're going to do. That's a more difficult part. That's the language that you have to use from your organization. Right? Can you, can you, uh, as a table, probably you can join as a big group and then pick one current state and define a future state and write a one-liner. Yes. That defines a future state. Leader, you have the architect, you have the product management uh, uh, VP, product uh, you know, owner of a particular product line, get an engineer, all of them together, and let's start doing this exercise. Imagine that. And the the discussion can be technical, this can be non-technical, it doesn't matter. Right? Take one aspect of current state and imagine the future state. So have you defined the current state, future state? I am coming across the table to help you. The next step is as a team, here is an interesting part. As a team, you have to draw this future state in a picture format. <laughs> is it easy, difficult? That's exactly where the people start thinking, people start going into the belief system of what is a future state, when they actually finish drawing it, they believe in it. Okay, so now I have defined a one-liner for this team. Uh, so this team can think, how do you, what is the kind of picture that you want to see? Put it in some picture format, no more words now. Then the picture becomes a language of communication across the organization. Okay, I will go to that. Picture, okay. Read the picture state before you understand the picture. Hold on, let me figure out. Is the customer sorry? Mm -hmm. Customer. Product one, product two. He's a product manager, and cross functional team is identity over there. Okay. So the current state was teams are organized based on operational efficiency, horizontal skill set. Where we want the team should be organized based on value to organization. Okay. Okay. Can you can you think a little better? and draw a better picture. <laughs> so this doesn't give me uh, the energy of the future state that I'm looking at, right? The picture, yeah. Okay. So, sorry, you have some picture. Okay, so I think uh, we are running short of time, so I would suggest you go ahead and paste the picture right there on the wall. But I'll give you some examples what people have done so far. For example, um, what is your future state? Or what is a one-liner? Okay, guys, listen, listen here. Let's hear their one-liner. Okay. So what they are saying is, I hire the best talent for the organization, not for the, the opening that I have locally, right? So that's a one way of defining. So that's going to 
actually lead to a future state and that will define how the organization will move. So, the process of hiring is going to change a lot. Okay. That team had a, a very interesting one liner. Just, just read. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. So, we actually discussed one more thing in the, in the previous example, right? So, when somebody writes a piece of code, they should, they should uh, remember or they should know who's, uh, who is going to smile in the real world. So, basically they understand what is the purpose of their work. So, the current state what they have defined is, I do not know why I am doing this work, what is the purpose of my work. The future state is, so that you have drawn that as well. Wonderful. So, can you paste those pictures right there? So, we are done. So, that is a beautiful exercise. It is not an easy exercise, okay. And especially if you want to get a diverse set of audience into this exercise, it is going to take time, but the first time it is going to be difficult, the second time, third time it is going to become much, much easier, okay. Let us move on to the second one. Uh, this I call as value narratives, okay. In, in where does, where do you find values of your organization? Where do you find the values of your organization? Where you should find is another question, okay. If you find in people, wonderful, right. So, so I am going to ask you, if I come to your organization, where can I see the value of the organization? Okay, so it is either in the poster, it is on the wall or it is some way it is being depicted, wonderful. But do we really see in people, people doing the uh, or exhibiting those values? So, that is a hard question and some organization they do and those organizations are moving towards organizational agility. Now, here is the exercise. I am going to describe what we are going to do. This is again a little bit of group exercise. We cannot do it alone. So, each table need to define three organizational values. Assume that you come from the same organization. I know you are from different organization. So, write down three values quickly. What are the three values of your organization? Maybe you can take your own organization values. So, my organization values be courageous, uh, um, win together and uh, let us say integrity above all. These are the three values for my organization. And be courageous is one value that I am focusing and the role that I am picking is a scrum master. This is an exercise that you do with the teams, okay. So, I am picking the role of a scrum master and the narrative that I give is this. The team is consistently uh, not performing very well. I as a scrum master believe the team can perform much better and I call for an uh, ad hoc retrospective meeting which is not at the end of the sprint and I say that we need to have this meeting now because we have the potential to become high performance team, but we are not, we are doing injustice to that. That is a scenario and that is the behavior that I exhibit, that is a narrative. Is this narrative give you a picture of how the scrum master leaves the value of be courageous? Do you see that? So, now you have to define one scenario or write one narrative to do that. Pick any role in a team. So, what actually happens in this exercise is at the end of the exercise, so the conversation we had is values are common. Say for example, one of the values they picked is uh, uh, be ethical. So, why we need to pick a role and then describe a narrative or a scenario? Because let us say for example, be ethical is a common value, there is no doubt about it. W but what is being ethical mean to me in my role? If I am a, a customer executive versus I am a procurement person, what is being ethical mean to me? So, if we can actually uh, nail down that scenario for as many roles as possible 
and then you print these narratives, a short passage of five lines or so into a small cards and leave the cards all over the place in your organization. So when people walk in, say, I'm a developer, oh, there's a card for me, I take, I pick up the card and I read the narrative, I get the value, then I start leaving. So that's the purpose of this exercise. Uh, how, the more your passage or your narrative is powerful, the easier it gets across to the people. Now let's move on to the third one. This is about uh, mapping the mindset of people. This exercise is very, very easy. Uh, there's nothing much involved. Say for example, I'm gonna give you five mindset that we want our teams to have. Number one, deliver value continuously. Uh, learn and adapt. And number three, keep things simple. And number four, um, believe in conversation rather than emails. And number five, technical excellence. These are the five values that, that we want to get the mindsets of people into. Let's keep these five, yeah. So the, the number one, deliver value continuously. Number two, uh, learn and adapt. And number three, keep it simple. Number four, believe in uh, conversations. And number five, technical excellence, All right? Now, as a team, assume that you are working in a particular team and you are, you are, you have a assessment of your own team's mindset towards these five items, right? These five mindset. Decide one thing, assume that it's, it's an imagination now at this point of time for our exercise, but in real life, every team can identify two things, right? What is the mindset they are comfortable exhibiting? Say for example, I'm number, in a scale of one to five, I'm number five in technical excellence, I am number one in, say, face-to-face -face conversation. You get the idea? So every team has, they know, every team has an assessment. Okay, so these are the mindset we exhibit from the teams, we expect from the team, and every team assesses themselves where they stand across these five mind, you know, mindsets. So you can define as many mindset as you want. Now, each team pick one, and then what happens? Let's say this team picks uh, technical excellence as their low point, let's say one, and this team picks technical excellence as their high point, number five. What's the next step to do? Get the teams come together and talk about it. And imagine now expand the exercise across hundreds of teams. So who is going to teach mindset? Who is going to get the mindset across to the teams or across to the people? That's one way to do it, and that's what we do in our organization. There's a board which has all the mindset listed. They have, we have listed all the teams in one, one side who are doing good, and there's another team which is waiting for somebody to teach them those values. And there is no more conversation happens. They come, look at the board, and they say, oh, this team is already number five in this value. Who is the point of contact? Let me call this guy. And I go to my team and say, hey, I have somebody to talk to. Can you join me? So this team gets an appointment to talk to them, and that's how it happens. So now the mindset is being uh, brought to the teams in a much nicer way. So that's one example. So it, it's about the team's assessment of how they are doing in that mindset, right? It's a self-assessment. If you feel that you are number five, five means I have mastered that mindset and all the people in my team exhibits that mindset, you can call yourself number five. One means we don't know how to do that or we are not exhibiting the value. It's your own assessment. I am very particular, nobody comes and assesses. It is your own assessment, the team assesses. Because that's where the power of self-organizing comes in, right? And then when, when somebody says I am five, what's going to happen next? Five more teams uh, are going to walk up to this team and start asking questions, right? If they just code five for the sake of making it five, imagine what's going to happen. It's actually a much embarrassing situation for the team. So it doesn't happen. This exercise is very, very simple, very, very powerful at the same time. It's there on the wall every day. Anybody can come and update. No, they're going to say, hey, this team sucks, that's all. 
No, there is nothing like that. As a team, we have to assess, not as an individual, right? So if everybody, is, if two people say five, two people say one, we are going to say one. Go with the lowest number. Okay, we'll we'll keep the conversation offline. There's a signal that time up. So I'm going to skip this exercise. I can talk about this later. Uh, this exercise is all about giving feedback. How many of you comfortable giving feedback to your manager, or your director, or to your VP? Okay, if you are comfortable, that it's great. This exercise, you don't need this exercise. If you are not comfortable, you need this exercise. We'll do it offline. <laughs> okay, cool. So this is my summary, right? It's a journey. It's all about bringing desired culture and mindset. It's riddled with complexities. To succeed in this journey, it calls for an adaptive leadership, leadership competency. This is my bottom line. It actually calls for a new skill sets in people, and that's a leadership competency. Some of us have, some of us are learning, some of us will have to pick it up. It's not going to come on its own. Okay, here is the question. Here is the final slide. Can we call this section, have we learned what we set out to learn? These are the two things I, these are the two conditions I have set in the beginning. To call this workshop is a value for your time. If yes, I'm happy. Thank you very much. Have fun. <laughs>